chapter 7 tonight. One of my predecessors in ministry, a man named Tom Ella, he was a young pastor. He started preaching out of the book of Romans. He thought that would be as good a book as any to preach out of as a young pastor. He said that when he got to, to chapter 5, he realized he was things had gotten out of control as far as his ability to, to get a grasp of what was there. And he actually stood up in front of his church and apologized to them and said that he wasn't ready to take them through the book of Rome. That's what Peter said. Starting in verse 15, but really we're going to, the middle of it, we'll pick up with the context we're looking at, looking for. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter understood, and Peter had worked with similar churches that Paul had. They understood that when Paul wrote, many of the things that God gave him, the revelations that he understood, were at a very, very high level. Now that is good and bad. It is good because we are getting something that is very solid, something that we need to build our faith upon. But also, as Peter said, some who are untaught and unstable will distort these things. And much of what we find in Paul's writing are some of the major distortions that we find as far as in the church, things that regarding the spiritual gift and other issues, they have been distorted. But what we're going to look at tonight is a tough part of Scripture. We are going to begin to build a foundation that will allow us to go into chapter 8. Now, I love Romans chapter 8. It is, it is at least right there with a small, short, select list of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Romans chapter 8 has some wonderful, wonderful things that you can quote out of there. And it seems like Paul jumps from one spiritual uh, gem to another spiritual gem. But as one pastor said, he hated to go through Romans 7. But somebody else says you can't get to Romans 8 unless you go through Romans 7. Romans 7 and Romans 8 stand together. Romans 8 talks about your victory. Romans 7 talks about your struggle. Because there are things in the Christian life that we struggle with. We can go through Romans chapter 6 and get a solid doctrinal foundation. And then we begin to try to apply it to life. And all of a sudden, this Christianity really is a struggle. We have failures. We have stumblings. And we don't really understand that. We know what the truth said in Romans 6. But we can't really gain the victory we want in Romans 8. And Romans 7 is Paul's testimony of his own struggle. And tonight we're going to look at, at really a... a something that should be an extension out of Romans 6, because really this is the second part of the questions that he asked in verses uh, 14 of chapter 6. But he begins to, to deal with the law, the struggle that some have with the law. That is a stumbling block to many people. And that is why we have people who can't really learn to use the Old Testament rightly, and they become legalists today. So that is a pitfall that you have when you try to live the... The, uh, the victorious Christian life, and you take things like you find in Romans 7, and you try to figure out how the law fits in. Because Paul has been saying over and over in Romans 6 that the law is something that somehow our relationship has changed in accordance to because of what Christ did and how we're identified with that. So if I haven't confused you already, we're going to start at Romans chapter 7, verse 1, and just look at six verses tonight and try to gain an understanding about what Paul is saying. How does the law help us handle the problem of sin, and what really is the reason for the law? Or do you, know, do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now that is 
a breaking point there. He's establishing a fact, and now he's going to make an application, starting in verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Now just reading through that, that probably confuses you somewhat. Maybe it doesn't answer questions just readily, right? right uh, on the crest of it all. You have to just think deeper and deeper. What is it exactly saying? And Paul understood that whenever you dealt with the law, especially with people who had a Jewish background, that there would be some confusion of how grace could fit in. Now, does the law help a person to handle the problem of sin? The question is answered by a yes and a no. Yes, in the sense that the law helps us define what sin is, what transgression is. But no, in the sense that the law cannot deliver us. The law can only condemn us. It can identify what sin is. And Paul says here that it actually generates and stimulates sin. Whenever the sin nature is told, don't do this, like the law says, it generates and it stimulates the rebellion that is there. And you could actually say that the law causes sin in a person because they react to a standard of conduct that is placed before them. So in a sense, the law does help us and hurt us. It's a yes and a no as to how the law addresses the problem of sin in our life. Now, you find a political debate, which we're going through right now. You listen to Al Gore and you listen to to, uh, George W. Bush. And both of them are probably going to point to the other party as being the reason that we have problems in our country. But the reason we have problems in our country is because of people. People with a sin nature, trying to live together, batting heads together, struggling with one another, causing crimes on each other, greedy against each other. That is the basic problem that we have in this nation, and it is called sin. It is a sin nature. And the more that sin nature is unrestrained as we are doing in our nation, the more problems, social problems, we are going to have, and the less solutions we will have to those social problems. There was a comic strip called Pogo, and in that comic strip, Pogo said, we have met the enemy, and it is us. We have met the enemy, and it is us. And that is the biggest enemy that you have to living the victorious Christian life, and that is yourself. Now, How do you take the law, and how do you take grace, and how do you find what God has done and what the benefits are with regard to your your Christian life? I want you to think of two words tonight. One is provision, and the other is appropriation. Provision and appropriation. Provision is what God has done for us. Much of that is explained in Romans chapter 6. We looked at, you know, last Sunday morning that God identified us, baptized us, immersed us into the body of his son. So that when Jesus died, when Jesus was buried, when Jesus was raised from the dead, that we were identified with that and we gained the benefits out of that. That was the provision that God made for us. We also found out that we were engrafted into Jesus. That means just like a one tree limb can be put into a, a different tree and, and get the growth out of that tree's life, that's what God did with us. With regard to the person of Christ, we were engrafted into him. That means that he is the vine, we are the branches, and we gain from his resurrection life. And not only that, but we also know that God made provision by the fact that we were crucified with Christ, that our old man, that sin nature, might be rendered ineffective. It might not have the ability to to determine and dominate and have mastery over us. God made that provision for you. A second word is appropriation. Appropriation. That's what you do with God's provision for you. And much of the problem we have in the church and in the lives of many Christians is they have not appropriated what God has provided, the provision God has for them. 
You can put all the things you want in the Bible with regard to promises and what God says He will do for you, but if you never, by faith, appropriate it for your life, make it practical in your situations, it might as well not be there. It might as well not be there. If you have a million dollars in your bank account and you never write a check, it might as well not be there for all the advantage that it does for you and your family. So Romans chapter 6, we see the provision God has given to us. But what is the appropriation that you have in your life? When you think of legalism, when you think of legalism, you think of measuring spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. A legalist is somebody who measures spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. It is someone who sees sins, but they don't see sin. They see sins, but they don't see sin. It is someone who judges by the outward and not by the inward. It is someone who fails to understand the real purpose of God's law and the relationship between law and grace. Paul is going to give us the foundation for why we shouldn't be legalists with regard to what we're going to look at tonight. Notice the first phrase, do you not know? Do you not know? That's the third time we've seen that. The third time. And every time that we see that, it's really been a point where we've started a brand new message because it gives us a whole new subject. Paul is gaining their, their thoughts by saying, don't you even know this? And they're saying, well, know what? Actually, we get our word agnostic from that same Greek, Greek word. You might, there are a lot of people out there that take pride in being an agnostic. But before they do that, they ought to know that the Latin equivalent to agnostic is ignoramus. <laughs> so you're really calling yourself the same thing. And Paul is saying, are you an ignoramus? Are you ignorant of these facts? And he clarifies, I'm talking to those who understand the law. So he's not making fun of people who may not have a, a grasp or a reason to have a grasp. He says, those who understand and know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, so she is joined to another. That is simple matter of a fact, civil law and biblical law. That if a woman is married to a, to a man, that that union is naturally broken by the death of the husband. If the husband dies, then she is free to marry another. If she marries another while the husband is still living. And notice this talks about a, a woman doing that. Men did that back in this, this time in, in history. That was not unknown for, for a man to have more than one wife. But the flip side under the Jewish culture was not, not, uh, not there at all. But under civil law, it was understood that if she married another man, she would be considered an adulteress. But if that man died, the first man died, that wouldn't be a concern at all. She would be free to marry another man. Now, the number one problem that you find when you go through these six verses is, who is that first husband? Some people have said that the first husband is the law, and that the law died to us in what happened with Christ, and that the law is no longer something that we have that connection with at all. Well, it can't be the law. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law at all. He made that one statement that until, until heaven and earth pass away, the law is not to be abolished. So it is not the law that dies. You've got a first husband, you've got a second husband, and you've got a woman. The woman is you. The woman is a Christian. The first husband... The first husband is your old Adamic nature. Or you in Christ crucified. Your second husband is you in Christ risen or, or resurrected. So it's the two sides of who you were. There is a me that is no longer alive today. That me is Guy McGraw outside of Jesus Christ. That person died. They don't live anymore. 
that person shared this body that I have, shared an address that I, that I lived at, but that person is no longer here, has my social security number, has my name, but they're dead. They are no longer in existence in this world today. The Bible says I am a brand new creature in Christ. That person died. When that person died, this person was free to have a brand new relationship to Jesus Christ, crucif to Jesus Christ who was risen, so that I might walk in newness of life with a brand new husband. It says a married woman is bound by the law to her husband, the old Adamic, the old Adamic law, until a death occurs. Now, the death happened when my old self was crucified with Jesus Christ. You find that all the way back in verse 6 of chapter 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. That is where the death happened that legally changes how we are in relation to the law. That our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away or rendered ineffective so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. It changed forever our relationship with who we could be a husband with. Now, as that was broken, as I received Christ as my Savior and Lord, and I was identified with him with everything that happened, and I was crucified with him, and so his death became my death in my old Adamic self, and that freed up who I was to be united with Christ resurrected with the new, brand new person of Jesus Christ. Now that is the application. We'll see that even more as we look down through here, starting in verse 4, as Paul makes his application as well. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die. In our old Adamic self, we were made to die to the law. Through the body of Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, I was identified with him, and I died on the cross with him. So when I died, I died to the law. The law had jurisdiction over me, until a death happened. And that changed everything. There's no double jeopardy. It changed everything with regard to my relationship with the law. I was made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you, remember it's got two yous, the you who I was and the you who I now am, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. So I got a brand new husband. That sound, I hope that didn't quote that right there by itself. I got a brand new husband. And that husband is Jesus Christ in the newness of life of his resurrection body, of his res resurrection position. My old husband was my old Adamic nature. I was born married in this world. I came into the world married to my old Adamic self. And that husband that I had, the old Adamic self, was placed on Christ and he died there and that set me free to be united with Jesus Christ God's son and why is that so important that we might bear fruit for God in chapter 6 it said that we might walk in newness of life everything might be brand new the old things passed away behold brand new things have come that means that your life can be amazingly different because of what Christ and your relationship with him is now. You are no longer under the jurisdiction of the law. The law no longer condemns you. That is why we go into chapter 8 and it says there is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ, united to Christ. The law no longer has that jurisdiction over you because a death happened. If you had an, an automobile accident and you caused it and you were killed in that same accident, they are not going to prosecute you because the fact of your dying separated you from the jurisdiction of the law. It set you free from that. And because you died, you were crucified with Christ, it set you free from the law's control and jurisdiction over your life. Now going on down to verse 5, it says, for while we were in the flesh, while before you came to, to Christ, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were
are at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. That is a verse that describes the life of an unbeliever. While we were still in the flesh. And look how things happen. The sinful passions aroused by the law. Part of your sin nature is that you have some sinful passion. You have some tendencies toward rebellion against God. They demonstrate themselves differently in different people. But every one of us has a tendency that maybe is suppressed pretty well in your life. Maybe it is unsuppressed in somebody's life. And they are just, just a habit towards sin. A John Dillinger or an Al Capone. But still, every one of us has a problem with sin. There are sinful passions that are aroused by the law. Now, if you went over to Africa and you took a Cape buffalo, a Cape buffalo is a docile-looking thing. It's got these horns that look like a river coming at you, but the huge horns on this Cape buffalo. And if you took one of those, and maybe it, it wandered into your backyard if you lived somewhere in Africa and it had a little calf with it, and it was just eating the grass, and it didn't really seem like anything that was a threat at all. But you dropped a cage around that animal. That animal is the second most feared animal other than a leopard in Africa. That animal would probably, by the power that it has, destroy that iron cage, trying to get out of those restraints. It would be pressing against the perimeter that you put around it. And people are like that, too. The sinful passions that were aroused by the law, as Paul describes it. You have people in this world, and you start going around to their, you start coming up to them and saying to, in their life, well, God's word says you shouldn't do that. God's word says that isn't right. The way I understand it, that is something you shouldn't be doing. That arouses a response out of them. You can talk to a lot of people, but you start bringing in the Bible, and God's word says this is proper and this isn't proper. You will get the snorting, and you will get the anger, smoke coming out of the ears. It will arouse. The law arouses a response. The sinful passions come out at their highest level when you begin to put the restraint of God's law around people. You tell kids in the schoolyard, I only want you to play so far. We don't have a fence here, and there is a line over there that you don't need to cross. Now, where do you think most of those kids are going to end up playing? right on the line and maybe trying to step over when you're not looking. The law that you gave them aroused within them their sinful tendencies. And because of that, it says their members were used for, which is the outcome of death. Now what are your members? Your members is just the outward expression of the inward sin. Your tongue, your mouth, the things that you say. The way that you act, the things you do with your, your bodily parts that everybody can see is just an expression, an outward expression of the inward problem of sin that you have. All of us, outside of Christ, you can clean up somebody pretty good. Somebody can get a little religious bend going in their life, and they can show up and sit in church and look as good as anybody else, but really... It's like a domesticated animal. There is a point in time where the wild nature will come out of that animal. Just given the right set of circumstances, that animal will demonstrate its, its wildness, its, its real tendencies. And many people that come to church from Sunday to Sunday are really just domesticated sinners. They are just coming in and they are just put them under a restraint of some sort that is acceptable. And, but if you put them in the right set of circumstances, their lostness will be demonstrated without a doubt. Now verse 6 says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Those two verses contrast a lost person to a saved person. A person who is married to the old Adamic nature and a person who is married to the new nature in Jesus Christ. One is walking with a direction toward death. The other is walking in a direction toward a newness of the spirit, a newness of life that Paul described it as, as earlier. Another has the sinful passions that are aroused by the law. And the other one has been released from the law to serve God in a brand new way. And Paul says it's not in the oldness of the letter, but it's in the newness of the spirit. 
That is the way that we walk in a brand new relationship with God. Not in the oldness of the letter, but in the newness of the Spirit. Now, let me try to explain the difference between those two, because I know that's confusing. If I lived about 19, early something, whatever it be, in the early 1900s, and I promised my son going to college that when he graduated from college, I would give him a horse and buggy. But while he was in college, maybe he's like these professional students, he was in college for maybe 12 years, but by the time he got graduated from college, the automobile was invented, and the automobile was the thing. Now, if I was a person who was going to give him according to the letter of the law, when he graduated, even though the automobile was a thing and horses and buggies were no longer being used, I would say, horse and buggy is what I promised you. Horse and buggy is what you're going to get. But if I was going to give him according to the spirit of the law, the spirit of my promise to him, when he graduated, I would give him an automobile, which would be an equivalent to what I had earlier promised him. It was in the spirit of what my promise was. It wasn't a legalistic application, but it was an application in the spirit of what I promised him. Now, we are to walk not in the oldness of the letter, not in the sense of rituals and regulations, and try to, to, to match these exact critical things. But we're to walk in the principles of the Old Testament law, as understood in the newness of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the difference. And many people who get into legalism and allow the law to gravitate as a, as a main thing in their, their life, they become very critical of others, very demanding of others. They put out all these self-made pharisaical rituals and rules. And they're operating in the oldness of the letter, not realizing that the law is there for the purpose of demonstrating and defining sin and righteousness in God's eyes and to show us that we fall short of God's standard. And as we have been transformed in our relationship in our brand new union with Christ, the law demonstrates what we should strive for according to what the mind of God says is right and wrong, but we serve in a brand new relationship of grace. A relationship that not just tells us what to do, but it compels us. It gives us the capability and the power to truly serve God and to please Him. So Paul is saying that we have a brand new relationship. That relationship is that something dramatic has happened, just as dramatic as if a wife lost one husband and is mar married to a brand new husband. We are in a brand new union, and our marriage is to the resurrected person of Jesus Christ. He is the bridegroom, and we are the bride.